Why was it that the Greeks were able to win the first and in many ways the most decisive of the battles of the Persian Wars, which were, began in 490 BC at the beginning of the classical period? The very first battle of the Persian Wars is what it's called, okay, between Greece and Pers the Persian Empire, um, was caused, all of the history books say, by a kind of discomfort outside of Greece with this notion of this tiny little place getting such good buzz, you know, in terms of what's going on there. There were some islands that were controlled by the Persian Empire, even though they were Greek, who started rebelling. And they asked for help from Athens. And then Athens said, okay, we'll help you. And that's when the Persian Empire really got into motion and said, hey, screw you, and marched over and sailed over and finally engaged in war with the Greeks, okay? That's the beginning of the Persian Wars. Now, why was it the Greeks were able to win the Battle of Marathon? Because of the new way of fighting. The Persian Empire, all of a sudden they land, and there's a bunch of these Greeks lined up with uh, walls of, of armor. I mean, it's ridiculous. Imagine, right? It's, it was an insane a, a mind F. I uh, won't say the F word again. Mind F, right? It was an insane mind F. And, and so that had a lot to do with why the Battle of Marathon, the Greeks were victorious. Ten years later, it took ten years for the Persians to say, okay, we're going to give it another shot. We underestimated the firepower of the Greeks. That, war, that battle in 480 BC is called the Mopoli. There were three battles that lasted over a period of 11 years in the Persian Wars. Okay, there were three major battles, Marathon, Thermopylae, and Salamis. After that, it wasn't like, okay, the war's over. Like, say, like at the end of World War II, everybody knew it was over, that was it, okay? It wasn't like that. There was no less a sense of foreboding in the air all around Greece after the Battle of Salamis, which we now, retrospectively, in history books, call the decisive battle of the Persian Wars. But as far as the Greeks themselves knew, after Salamis, there could have been a fourth battle. You know, there could have been a fourth or a fifth or a tenth. No one knew. So how do you safeguard that from happening? Pericles is the name of the general who had the most power after the Persian Wars, and someone's got to kind of be in charge, even if it's a democracy, and that happens to be the guy with the army behind him. Okay, so that, his name is Pericles. And what he does is he makes it clear to the rest of Greece that he and the rest of the Athenians believed that because they were the most instrumental in the victory over the Persian Empire, that they were going to be the leaders of a band, a club almost, an organization that all of the polis, all of the city-states of Greece who wanted to be protected by Athens, okay, because they were by far, other than Sparta, there was you know competition between them, um, the most prominent uh, military force around Greece, if they wanted to be protected and be part of this organization to, as a, to hold up a common front against any potential future enemy, whether it be the Persian Empire or someone else, a representative from each of the polis, remember that's the plural of polis, needed to come to Athens every year and pay tribute to Athens, but officially to the treasury of the Delian League. It's called that because the Delian League began symbolically on the island of Delos, D-E-L-O-S, which, as you'll remember, is the island that Apollo and Artemis were born on. Okay, so um, it's that island kind of between east and west, uh, standing right in the middle uh, between the east coast of Greece and the west coast of what would eventually become the Persian Empire, what was called Asia Minor. Okay, and so, you, so very symbolically, the Delian League begins on the island of Delos between the two warring parties in the Persian Wars. But then as time goes on, Pericles gets more and more, no other word for it, full of himself, or phrase, and moves the treasury of the Delian League from the island of Delos, which was considered to be a neutral place, now to Athens itself. That was the first thing that pissed off a lot of Greeks all over Greece. Pissed them off so much that at first there was enough resistance to where it almost didn't happen. So Pericles had to come up with a way, or ways, but one very prominent way that it pertains to what we're going to talk about today, to make it worth the while of the various polis from around Greece to come every year and pay tribute to the Delian treasury. Okay, that was the idea. Think about it. That's the, the way that they were members. They had to pay their tribute, which is another word for tax, okay? 
to the Delian treasury every year. And the only way to do that, because there was no such thing as mail yet, right, let alone wiring funds, okay, so think about it, you had to travel. You had to travel sometimes hundreds and hundreds of miles away. And that's, you know, at a time when, you know, whether you were doing it by foot or by horse, for the most part, um, that was a giant deal, okay? And our, our mule, even, okay? So, so it was a big deal to make that kind of uh, trip. Why should we have to go anywhere? You come to us. We're the ones protecting you. We're the ones who built up enough of an army slash, especially, fleet to be able to defend all of Greece, as we proved, right, in the Battle of Salamis. So you're the ones who need to do the traveling. We're not even going to go to Delos. So the idea was that after all that time to get to Athens and then have nothing to do other than to pay money to Athens in order to protect them was not a very sustainable business plan, if you will. So there needed to be some other incentives for the police from around Greece to go to Athens each year. Okay, and the most famous and effective one was to entertain the people who came to Athens every single year, whenever they came, just happened to have a festival called the Pan-Athenaic Festival. Pan-Athenaic, in other words, the All-Athens Festival. In other words, we're all Athenians. All of us are Athenians in the sense that Athens protects us all. Okay, and yes, Athens is the one who said that. You know, there's a very famous speech that I'm having you guys read that has Pericles straight out saying that we're the best there is and just deal with it, okay? Because we played the most important role in the Persian Wars and we're the ones protecting you guys. So yeah, we are the ones who call the shots. This is a purely uh, um, utilitarian interpretation of theater, I realize, okay? Because there's a lot more to theater and when you look at when you read about theater in, in especially histories of literature as opposed to histories per se, you don't read that much about this idea of there being a kind of propagandistic aspect um, to the advent of theater. But there really is. Okay, there really is. It, 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 was a, it was an opportunity to get representatives from the various polis all over Greece, not only to come to Athens and feel like there was more reason to do so than just to drop off money, but get this to be able to get 13,000 people sitting in one place so that the one who has the authority to stand there and tell them something, Pericles, can do so, so that within a matter of a few performances, theater performances, Pericles can conveniently come up in front of the audience between each of them and say who cares what. The point is he can say something that all of the people from all over Greece will hear. Try that pre-Facebook, <laughs> right? Pre-Twitter, pre-Instagram, pre-Snapchat, uh, pre-all that stuff, right? None of that. There was none of that, right? Let alone movies, let alone TV, let alone telephones, telegraphs, any of that kind of technology. This is a cynical interpretation of theater, right? But I think it, it bears out historically, you know, because there was no other way to get everybody in one place. Listen, so... Um, Pericles was a genius at using the theater not only to entice people to come for the intrinsic value of the performances that we're going to talk about. We're going to, you know, they better be some damn amazing performances to warrant this kind of, of buzz, right? And they were, okay? But also to get them to sit in one place, to listen to whatever Pericles has to tell them. And you can bet, you can be darn sure, um, and even based on the speech that we're reading from Thucydides that, that Pericles delivers, that when he went in front of the audience and delivered whatever message he did to whatever audience was sitting in that particular performance, it was masterful. It, it got across exactly what he wanted to say. In a, you know, like it was probably written by a speechwriter. Okay, rhetoric was a giant discipline. The ability to create speeches most persuasively was. I mean, if there were any heroes when it came to things dealing with words, it wasn't poets, and it wasn't even actors on the stage. It was lawyers. It was orators. It was those who created speeches that, per that persuaded. Okay? And so you can be darn sure that there was some serious rhetorical ingenuity at work whenever these speeches were delivered in front of all those people. Okay? So just keep that in mind as a historical backdrop for the creation creation, I said, okay, because the Athenians invented drama, 
the fifth century after the Persian Wars were the first to implement drama and theater in a systematic way anywhere in the world. Okay, then it spread quickly, and then you have that's why you have all kinds of theaters all over Greece, right? Let alone Rome later on. Okay, but it all began in Athens. And so on a purely historical and propagandistic level, what I just said applies. But now let's get into the intrinsic nature of drama and theater and, and get a better appreciation of that because that will point forward to our times, you know, any, you know, in terms of any kinds of narratives that involve actors and actresses on a stage or on screen or wherever else is going on now and in our heads if we have implants and we're virtual reality eating it. It all comes from this uh, initial gesture, this crazy idea of putting people in front of other people and having them pretend to be other people, right? Something we take for granted now. This is invented by the Athenians. Okay, so where did it start? Where did drama start? Pericles and the Athenians of the fifth century BC invented theater. Drama as a genre was a little before that. It was about 50 years earlier than that. Guys remember, hopefully it was interesting to you, that stuff about new forms of wealth and the advent of democracy based on more and more people being able to afford weapons, this and that, okay. That's one aspect of that development that began with colonization after the time of Homer, okay. So lots of people curious about the world as represented by Odysseus in the Odyssey, this idea of expanding your horizons, moving all over the place. One aspect of that movement Okay, of colonization in, in Greece in the 8th century BC and onward was cr creating new forms of wealth that led to more and more people being able to defend themselves and thus to become indispensable to a war cause so that the few who in the past had been the only ones who could afford weapons no longer fought one-on-one -on -one anymore. Now you had that wall of fighters and the hoplite warfare. That's one aspect of the colonization movement. There's another one though. And we did talk, and it's connected, it's connected. Remember, and here's the link. Remember that um, I told you about the religious vases, religious art created a demand in the minds of those who had the sense that it was important for, you know, to maximize as much as possible the chances of themselves and their families and friends being properly buried so that their spirits will enjoy peace in the afterlife. And so there's that link, that, that really interesting link that is fueled by religious belief, okay? That's one aspect of things, but let's just focus on that artwork, on, on, those, on those vases, those vases. Where did they come from? Where they came from, they were the direct result of experimenta artistic experimentation that was another result of all that branching out in, uh, away from the metropolis, the mother polis, okay? Into all of these different islands and different areas around Greece and really outside of Greece. And as there was all that spreading around, we did talk about there were new forms of art in the form of those religious faces, but also new forms of poetry, right? And I kind of hinted at that uh, for you guys. So let's expand that a little bit more. So it all began with epic. It began with epic in the whole world because we looked at the epic of Gilgamesh in, in Mesopotamia and we saw that epic was the very beginning of poetry, really of any kind of creative, use of language in a public setting. Okay, it all began with epic poetry. That deals with big ideas. That deals with idea, you know, ideas rooted in history, rooted in giant events like wars, and that involve heroes. And in the case of the Greeks and the Mesopotamians, if you call it and the Egyptians as well, gods also, okay? Involving all these really big themes, right? Really major themes. This is where, you know, epic is where heroes come from. Right? But as time goes on, and there's this dispersal, you try saying that three times, this dispersal, this dispersal, this dispersal of the population all over Greece, what happened was that the poetic genres also loosened up. And so instead of only having epic, now you have new functions of, uh, for poetry. As opposed to epic, where you have one guy sitting, most likely on a throne of some kind, with a, a ancient equivalent to a harp in his hand called a lyre and singing to a small audience about these big ideas. Now eventually what you have is you have the same type of person, whether it be a man or a woman, we'll talk about Sappho a little bit, sitting in some kind of you know, seat of some kind and singing to not too many people. But now instead of singing 
about giant themes like war and about heroes and etc. Now you're singing about what? Yourself. And this was, in, this was a revelation. This was a, a um, innovation that really had legs and that um, resonated enough in whatever, there's a lot of debate about where these ideas started, um, but mainly islands around Greece. Once, once this idea of a singer sitting there and singing not about monumental themes in the third person, but rather about personal themes in the first person, that really took off the way it did all the way up until our times. When you listen to the radio, that's what you got, right? So when you listen to a song, one person saying something about him or herself, lyric poetry began that whole trend of singing, not about more impersonal themes, but rather about personal themes, okay? So what happened was initially, that kind of poetry called lyric poetry because it was accompanied by that instrument called the lyre, okay, that remember Apollo was pretty much the patron of, and also the muses that he hangs out with. Lyric poetry began with one person singing about his or her emotional state, you know, personal things, but then as time went on, there were various subgenres of this new genre of poetry. And one of those subgenres was called choral poetry or chorus. C-H-O-R-U-S. What is choral poetry? Choral poetry began, it, it developed into a much more complex uh, manifestation as time went on, but it began with not one person singing about something personal, but several people singing about something personal, and it was the exact same thing and at the exact same time. So a lot of people singing the exact same thing for a small audience. Got me? So epic began with one person singing to a small group of people about monumental themes, heroic themes, etc. Lyric poetry began as one person singing to a small group about his or her personal issues. And then choral poetry branched out from there to where now it's really almost exactly the same as what I just said. Now instead of one person singing about personal issues, you have a bunch of people singing about personal issues. And they're all singing in unison, is what it's called. Okay, not, without counterpoint, without harmony. Okay, they're not they're not different voices. If you guys know what that stuff means, you know, bass, tenor, alto, and soprano. You don't have these different voices going on. You know, bouncing off each other the way you do later on with polyphony, with, with polyphonic music. It's unison music. Okay, it's everybody singing the same thing. Kind of like if you were in grammar school and you were part of a chorus, you had some kind of group singing something. Okay, that, that's all. It's just a chorus. So why do I tell you about this? Because this has to do with the origin of drama as far as, as far as we and the ancient Greeks knew. Think about choral poetry. How the heck did drama grow out of it? Supposedly, around 550 BC or so, one of the members of a chorus, I'll give you his name in a second, I'm sure you know it. I'm sure several of you know it. Okay, one, one of the members of the chorus one day Remember, the chorus was all singing exactly the same thing. Waited until the chorus sang the same thing as usual, and then did something revolutionary. And I know this is probably apocryphal to some extent. It, it's a nice story. You know, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. But this is at least what the ancient Greeks believed about the origin of what became such an important movement. So that's helpful as well, even if it was bullshit. Okay? The idea here is this one guy steps away from the chorus once it finishes singing, what, what it sings together, and responds to what they just sang, okay? And says something back. What Some say that it was something smart-ass, like, oh yeah, you think that's true, then blah, 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 you know. But the point is, it was a response. It was a response to the chorus. Now to us, big F and deal, right? Okay, so, but the idea here was not simply a matter of having a conversation. It was a matter of having a conversation in front of an audience. That was the revolution. Why? Because epic poetry consisted of one poet singing about a bunch of characters requiring the audience to imagine all of those characters really existing. And the advantage to epic is that when you do that, you can also have them imagine whatever the hell you want them to imagine, such as they're at sea, they're in the mountains, you know, they're in, in Olympus, blah, blah, blah. On stage, things are a lot more limited when it comes to that. But other than that, that was a, a big deal to have someone step out 
and to, to interact with the chorus. What was the name of the dude? Thespis. And you get the adjective thespian, right, in English, which means a good actor. Okay, so Thespis was the very first actor of all time, supposedly. Okay, around 550 BC. Different dates, some say 530, whatever, but don't worry too much about it. Okay, but we're talking 6th century BC. He's the first actor. He's the guy who first stood out. Now, once that happened, that was the beginning. That was a watershed. And from that moment on, until the very first of the three tragedy writers called tragedians who would come along and add more actors to the, to the mix, that's how drama began. One actor and a chorus. So that was the limited interaction that, that occurred in plays, you know, originally. Is you had a chorus saying one thing and one actor interacting with that chorus. And luckily, we have one play by the ancient Greeks that shows us what real, pretty much how boring um, that kind of drama was and why it was that one playwright came along and did something not quite as revolutionary, but the next step in revolutionariness. And what was that? Adding another actor. And once you had two actors, then at least you, you loosened things up to where now you can have a conversation between the two actors with the chorus overhearing without the two actors knowing or with them knowing or one character interacting with the chorus and then the other actor eavesdropping on, the, on both of them or whatever, or all of them separately in three different places, geographical areas as imagined by the audience, etc. That was a giant deal. So I'm going to give you the name of that guy. His name was Aeschylus. He's the guy who introduced a second actor into the brew, and he's the first of three playwrights, and in particular writers of tragedy. We're going to distinguish between tragedy and comedy, so we'll call him a tragedian, the guy who writes tragedies. So he's the first of three tragedians who were considered by none other than Pericles to be one of, quote, the three, unquote. Okay, Pericles proclaimed that there were three playwrights out of all the others, some of whom ended up being more successful than any of these three guys that we'll talk about. But Pericles favored three playwrights, and because of them, we have more work by them than any other tragedians in, in ancient Greece, which is not to say that we have most of what they wrote, um, but we have um, the most from them than anyone else. Okay, so Aeschylus introduced a second actor, and before we get into the difference between the different playwrights, let's just kind of get them all in the open, and then we'll compare them. A little later, and moving on into the uh, 5th century BC, we have the playwright named Sophocles, probably the most famous of the tragedians, thanks to Sigmund Freud mostly, I think. And he's the guy responsible for Oedipus the king and Electra, so you have the Oedipus complex, the Electra complex, and all kinds of other stuff that Freud really took a lot from these tragedians, which should tell you a lot, right? So Freud, the guy, the, the psychologist, uh, psychi psychiatrist from the early 20th century, and the guy most famous for pretty much inventing the subconscious and the significance of the fact that there's so much goes on under the surface of the psyche that isn't brought out into consciousness unless you work hard at bringing it out there, et cetera, you know, all that kind of stuff with repression and, you know, pretty heavy stuff. And then various students of his took off from where he left off. And it tells you something that the Greek tragedians, more than any other authors, including Homer, by the way, were considered by a guy like Freud to be the ones from ancient Greece that are most worthy of being culled from, you know, whose works are most worthy of being quoted and used as examples of the kinds of stuff that goes on in the mind in a complex manner. Okay, so this gives you a little hint about what, what is so special about these tragedies that, that um, was able to lure people from all over Greece to come each year to experience them within the context of a world where there's no movies or TV or radio or any of that. It's hard for us to imagine how exclusive this stuff was. You know, this, this is it. If you don't, there's no VCR, let alone DVD recorder, DVR, whatever, available. You know, you either make it to the performance or you have to wait till next year. Okay, so we're talking about a giant deal and it's just something that takes a lot of imagination to import yourself into a context where performances can be that important in a historical sense, uh, but they were. Now let me give you the third of, quote, the three, according to Pericles, Euripides. Okay, so now Sophocles introduced a third actor. Okay, so just think, just remember, first you have Thespis, who was the first actor, then you have Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, quote, the three, according to Pericles. And Aeschylus introduced the second actor, 
Sophocles, a third actor. Now when you have three actors, you can have three different things going on at once. The chorus maybe being involved with two of the three, but not the third, or with one of them and the other two, or conspiring against the, you know what I mean? You, the sky's the limit. It's an exponential increase in potential types of interactions between characters on the stage once you introduce that third actor to such an extent that when Euripides came along a little after, he was a contemporary of Sophocles, they competed against each other sometimes. So we're talking 5th century uh, beginning and on to the middle of the 5th century BC. And then once you have Sophocles and Euripides, Euripides didn't introduce a fourth actor. It was just considered to be overkill to have four actors on the stage plus the chorus. So he had to innovate in other ways. And the way that Euripides innovated most famously was he was considered by the most important literary critic of the ancient world, who also happened to be one of the most important philosophers, Aristotle, to be the most tragic of the three. Uh, what did that mean? It meant like psychologically probing, probing into the pain of the characters of the sort that you associate with the very word tragedy. Okay, And so he was the most tragic of the three, but more particularly, he was the dramatist who was most instrumental in incorporating the psychology of one particular group of people in society who before him hadn't been considered important enough to probe the psychology of, and that is women. Okay, And so Euripides is the tragedian par excellence in exploring the psyche of women within the context of a world where women had had it to say the least, very, very shittily, okay, where they had not only no um, political power, but really no say over their own persons. If they were married to their husband, their husband got pissed off enough at them and he killed them, there was no legal recourse, okay, it was that bad. It got a little better as time went on, but when, when we're talking, the period we're talking about and the um, transition from the archaic to the classical and then on into the late classical, this was definitely the case, okay? So the idea here is that the um, progression from Aeschylus to Sophocles to Euripides became more and more realistic over time. So with Aeschylus, you're still kind of in the zone of, of mythology. And so a lot of the topics that he covered in his tragedies dealt with the types of mythical stuff that Homer dealt with and that Hesiod dealt with. And then when you get into Sophocles, it's somewhere in between. And then with Euripides, quite often, you don't have any gods show up at all or any heroes show up and it's just regular old people doing stuff. Okay. Now that being said, this idea of incorporating regular old people into a drama on the stage took a while to develop. You know, so with the Aeschylus, it was unheard of that you would have that. It was, you know, the idea was that if a play is important enough, then of course it's going to involve the kinds of monumental topics that Homer covers in epic or that he see it covers in the Theogony and his other major work that we didn't really talk about the works and days. But eventually with Euripides that, ha that occurred. You know, more realism was instituted. So the question is, how did you not only make use of these great writers so that they created characters and actors who played the characters on the stage? You had to come up with a venue. You had to come up with a reason for people to come and an event that was, like we talked about, every single year that occurred and that people would come to from all over Greece in order to pay tribute to the treasury of the Delian League, but then at the same time to be able to experience these amazing plays. And that venue was the Panathenaic Festival that I referred to earlier. It happened every year. Now, Pericles had another ulterior motive for coming up with the Panathenaic Festival, and that was to establish Athens not only politically, economically, and militarily, but also culturally as a, but then eventually the, pretty much, cultural hub of Greece to compete with the other cultural hubs that were already well established, such as Delphi, where Apollo is the patron god of Delphi, where the most famous oracle exists, Olympia, the place where Zeus is the patron god of, where the Olympics occurred every four years, just like they do today, right? Those are the two most important that Athens saw themselves as competing with in terms of being the places of record to make a pilgrimage to from all over Greece 
in the case of Olympia, every four years, but in the case of Delphi, whenever it was necessary to go ask the important questions of the Oracle of Delphi, and really Apollo indirectly through the priestess of Apollo, the Pythia. Okay, and so Athens established the Panathenaic Festival in order to compete with those other shrines, those other places of worship, and they were successful at it. So unlike the Olympics, which were sports, here you have a kind of Olympics for art, you know, for drama, dramatic art. And the way that it worked was you had three different tragedians competing against each other day after day. So one day, one tragedian was the feature. The next day, another tragedian was the feature, and then the third day, a third. And so you had three tragedians competing against each other, writing, directing, and acting in all three of the tragedies that they composed. So you had three tragedians, each of them composed three tragedies, a trilogy, okay? And then after those three tragedies, you had another kind of play called a satyr play that was kind of designed to lighten the mood after all those heavy-ass uh, tragedies that involve so much, you know, death and destruction and, and, and depression and, and all that other kind of stuff. Okay, a satyr play was like one step between a tragedy and a comedy. Okay, you had a lot of a, a kind of buffoonery going on. And so that was the closest you have to something like a um, sitcom, at least for a while. And so day after day you had the competition and then whoever won got all kinds of the equivalent of money and renown and things like that. So let's, let's get a little bit, I don't know, kind of philosophical about what drama is, okay? And what was so special about tragedy, all right? So all the stuff we've looked at so far had to do with the historical context of theater, right? And also the development of drama and then also the venue in which the tragedies were performed, and then comedy as well, but focusing on tragedy. Now let's get into drama itself. What is so special about it? What was it that was so kind of addictive to those who competed from all over Greece to be the ones to be able to travel to Athens to experience these things? Okay, don't forget, you're talking about polis from all over Greece that don't have theater, which is another way of saying that except for epic poetry and lyric poetry, they didn't have performance at all. They didn't have movies, we might call it today, you know, what we associate with movies, any kind of, you know, so think of your favorite movie in the whole world and you being, hey, can I be the one to go deliver the money to Athens so I get to watch that movie, right? Otherwise, you don't get to see the movie, all right? To really put it in its basic level, that's what's going on here. Okay? So what was it? What was the big deal? First of all, why is drama called drama? Okay, it comes from an ancient Greek word, dramain, meaning to do or act. So from the very beginning, the focus on drama was on what differentiated it from epic poetry. In epic poetry, you have one poet sitting there and yeah, probably gesturing and using different tones. But other than that, just pretty much being one guy singing about a bunch of imaginary characters that the audience was expected to imagine along with them. Okay? Right. So it makes sense that when you come up with a new way of delivering characters to the minds of audiences, it's what is different about this new way that would make sense to be part of the name for this new thing. And drama is what's going on. Because now you not only have a bunch of characters that are being imagined in the minds of both the poet and the audience, but now you have actual people acting in front of other people. And so that was the big deal. That was the, that was the novelty of drama more than anything else. You had people doing things that you didn't have to pretend they were doing. Yes, you had to pretend that it was the king of Thebes you know, doing what he was doing. Yeah, you had to pretend that. But you didn't have to pretend that it was a real person doing a real thing. And so within the context of the drama, the relationship between those two people, they're arguing. All you had to do was imagine that what they were arguing about was real, but you didn't have to imagine they were really doing the arguing. And so that has a lot to do with why drama is called drama. Okay? It has to do with the fact that they're actually doing something in front of you, as opposed to the poet having you pretend they are. You know, obviously, in our society these days, Number one, we have derived this very idea of drama from the Greeks, but also we use the 
term drama in a much looser way in different contexts than the, the original sense. So talk about the genre of literature, that's the closest to the ancient Greeks. You know, you talk about a drama, uh, but then you talk about the drama category, you know, of films. So if you go to Netflix and, and you look for dramas, that you know, that's one thing. And then also um, you talk about drama in a more figurative sense, you know, the drama between people in the household enacting various roles. And then there are actually psychologists who get into a theory of transformational interaction where they claim that people are actually acting when they're seeming to be types of characters when they fight with each other, this and that. And melodrama is another term that we use, uh, over-the-top kind of drama. So let's look at the different parts of a theater. Uh, first of all, the theater itself is called the Theater of Dionysus for reasons that we talked about when we got into Dionysus, the god of wine, but also the god of drama. Um, and the idea here is they're associating drama with the god of a substance that is psychotropic, that, that changes the state of the mind um, by imbibing it. And, and so that was the idea. You associate um, wine with what happens to you as an audience member of a tragedy. Okay, that gives you some idea about um, what effect the tragedians were trying to um, have on, on their audience. Okay, so the teatron, there's the name up there, teatron is what the, the name theater itself comes from. And that's where the people sat and watched. It comes from an ancient Greek uh, verb, teatomai, meaning to watch. Okay, so that's the watching place. Okay, that's the teatron. And so theater is the name given to the, the entire complex, okay, named after the Teatron. <clears throat> okay, then you have the orchestra, which will probably surprise you. It's not a bunch of people sitting there with instruments playing music. The orchestra is this middle area, kind of the semicircle between all the spectators in the Teatron, and that's where the actors and the chorus did what they did. Okay, where, they, where they enacted the, the drama, did all the doing, all right? And so <clears throat> the reason why it's called the orchestra is that orche in ancient Greek means dance, it means dance. So it gets across the fact that the chorus from the very beginning in drama was doing more than singing the same thing together the way a chorus does, but they were also moving around a lot and that's also reflective of the, the word drama term drama. Okay, so that's the, the dancing area is the orchestra. And then as time goes on, you know, it's the acting area. It's the place where all the movement goes on and that incorporates dancing and acting. And then the third and final of the, the most important um, kind of landmarks of the theater were behind the orchestra. Sometimes it would extend all the way along, etc. This is called the scheme. S-K-E-N-E. -E. And that in ancient Greek means tent because it was the place where, and we'll talk about masks in a second, the masks, the costumes, and other implements that were used to put on the play were stored. So if you were in Little League and you, know, you think about the, where the balls and the bats and the helmets were held, that, that equipment uh, room, equipment area. That's the equipment area, and it's called the scheme, which means tent, but then by extension, you know, the place where things are kept. Now, guess what word in English comes from scheme? Scene. Yes, scene. Why? Anybody know? How does scene, or I'll give you another hint, scenery, how the heck does that come out of the word scheme? If I just told you that at first, hint, hint, at first, the skene, the, the significance of it was only to um, put equipment in it, you know, to, to hold equipment. Anybody have any idea how the transition went from that very idea of nothing but a place to hold equipment to scenery and scene? It's a matter of the skene grew bigger and bigger and became more of an issue as the backdrop of the action. The idea was, hey, wait a minute, if that ugly damn building is going to be standing behind the acting, why not do something with it? And so painting scenes on the scheme it took a long time. But no one knows who the thespis of scenery was. But the idea is that eventually the scheme became bigger and bigger and more and more of a factor as a backdrop of the action. We're going from a tiny little tent 
holding the bare minimum of, of equipment to a backdrop that is wholeheartedly part of the fiction of the play itself. And yeah, there were funds, thank you the rest of Greece, bringing all that tribute to Athens that helped pay for it, put into building different skenai, which is the plural for it, each year um, in the Pan-Athenaic Festival.